Hey, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Everyone enjoying their, uh, their first day of DevCon? I hope so. It's all, all we've had is breakfast, really, so how do you, how do you mess that up? Um, my name is Andrew Paulson. I'm a software architect at FileMaker. I've been at FileMaker for, actually, I think, I think it's 11 years. It might be time for me to update this slide. Um, in that time, I've done a lot of work on the UI, um, our inspectors. Most recently, I've been working on the, uh, the new layouts that were introduced in FileMaker 12, styles, themes, performance, making all that stuff faster for you all. Today is going to be, it was, it was a fun session to put together. This is an under the hood session, so I'm going to try to get in as many technical details as I can, get you guys some of the information you need to understand to figure out how to best use layouts in FileMaker. But this is also an intermediate session, so I'm trying to not make it too over the top technical. So I, I hope I've succeeded. Um, if you do have any questions while I'm going, I ask you to hold them till the end, and then uh, we'll hopefully leave some time towards the end for, for anything you, you want clarification on. So we're going to start out today with some basics. Uh, we're going to talk about how layouts get put together inside the app. And then we're going to move on a bit to talk about how the data gets into that layout and how it gets drawn to the screen. Uh, at the end, I'm going to spend a bit of time showing about how all these things come together in some of the new features in FileMaker 16. And then we'll close it out with some, uh, some top tips if we have time, some things you can do to take advantage of what we've learned today. So we're going to start out with the fundamentals, which I think is a safe place to start. Uh, for some of you, this might be a bit of review. I'll try to move through it quickly. But uh, mostly, I want to get everyone on the same page with the terminology. And the terminology that I'm going to use might not be the same terminology that we use in our documentation in the product. This is the terminology we use behind the scenes in the code. So, we're going to start out by talking through what makes up a layout, what are the pieces and parts that are important for getting it rendered. We're going to talk about layout objects, which I hope you're all familiar with, parts, context, and then we're going to introduce the concept of views, which are a big part of how FileMaker gets things done when you're looking at the screen, but really nothing that you ever touch directly. But they're, they're something you need to understand if you want to make a performance solution. So, at its most simple, a layout is just a two-dimensional space. And in FileMaker, the height of the layout is determined by the total height of all the parts. And the width is set by you with the explicit layout width. That didn't always used to be the case. Before FileMaker 12, and if you start dealing with converting some older solutions, you might want, how do, how do I resize this layout? It, it, there's nothing here that lets me change the width. Before FileMaker 12, we actually defined the width of the layout based on the rightmost edge of the rightmost object. So if you convert an old solution into FileMaker 12 or later, that's what you're going to see. That edge is going to be set up right against that right object, which isn't really what you always want. Now we have a little bit of more freedom. You can set that however you want, leave a little bit of extra space between the edge of your layout and your last object. Um, so inside of that 2D space, we have a list of the parts. And we'll get into those in a second. We have a list of objects. We have a base table alias from where we start our, our fetching of data. And then we have the themes and the styles that tell us not just what to draw, but how to draw it. So parts are at the bottom of the layout stack. They have a couple of important properties, the first of which is the part type. The part type tells us where it goes and how it behaves when you switch into the list view. I'm not going to dive into all the different types of part here, but uh, the two that are really special that behave like none of the other parts are the navigation parts that we introduced in FileMaker 14, maybe? Um, they float outside of the, the, the document space. When you scroll the document, they don't move. When you zoom the document, they don't zoom. All the rest of the parts live inside the same coordinate space, the same scrolling space, even though you might see a header get pinned to the top, it's still inside that same, uh, the same origin as the rest of the body parts. The other pieces that are really important for parts are how tall they are and where they're at, the, the Y position. The relationship between parts and objects is a little weird. Um, objects can contain one another. You see that with tab controls. You see that with popovers. 
parts don't really contain objects. And, and you can prove that to yourself by taking a rectangle, dragging it bigger than the part that it's in, and it'll happily extend its way into the other parts. However, the fact that it looks like it takes up two parts, it doesn't really. Every object belongs to one single part. And the simple rule is wherever the top left corner of your object is, that's gonna be the part that it belongs to. When you have objects that are nested inside of other objects, like tab controls, then it's really the top left-hand corner of the topmost object. So if you have a tab control that spans three parts, all of the objects inside of that tab control are going to belong to the part that contains the top left corner of the tab control. Um, we never really had to go over this too much, but when you look at the uh, layout object window, you'll see that groups kind of break this rule. And you can have a group that spans multiple parts, and what we do when we figure out which part each object belongs to when they're in a group, is we sort of break apart that group, and we treat them as if they are top-level objects. So that's a little caveat to keep in mind. Layout objects. When I'm talking about layout objects, I'm talking about the model. I'm talking about the thing that we use to store the position of an object, where it's gonna show up on your screen, um, the size, its parent. In the case of things like portals and tabs, that's another important piece of layout object. A layout object, they don't live in a list. They live in a tree. So as you add groups, as you add tabs, you're making that tree deeper and deeper. Some objects have things associated with them to facilitate loading data, like fields. All objects have styles that tell them how to draw, whether it be red or blue. Uh, and then objects also have other things attached to them, calcs that control conditional formatting and visibility. At this model level, when I say layout object, there's no data. There's no row. There's no actual visibility or actual style. There, these objects that I'm talking about are not what you see on the screen. What you see on the screen are what we call internally views. And views are in-memory objects that FileMaker creates to facilitate rendering your layout. So you can see up here I've got an example of a layout. On this side, we've got the layout objects, the model. And on that side, we've got the views that get created. When you're in a multi-record view, uh, like list view, we wind up with multiple views for a single layout object. So here on the left-hand side, you see uh, we've got three layout objects in part two, object four, object five, object six. When you go to view it, right now we're looking at five records. There's gonna be 15 layout object views, five for each of those layout objects. Um, same thing goes for portals. If you've got a portal, any object inside that portal, you're gonna wind up with multiple representations of it. When we scroll these views on and off screen, we try to make things a little bit faster by not actually throwing them away. So if you've got room on your screen for 10, 10 rows and you start scrolling, we'll make a few extra, but then as the rows get scrolled off the screen, we actually just hide them. Uh, they sit there inactive until we need them again. We shuffle them into their new position. Then we send them all a message that says, hey, you represent a new row. Draw yourself. We'll get into how that works in a little bit here. Um, so those are the ba basic components. We've got the layout. Layout objects live in parts. Parts contain uh, information about context, where you're going to load your data from. And layout objects kind of give us our instructions for drawing. Uh, that's all the information we need to get your information onto the screen. So the steps when you load a layout for the first time, first thing we gotta do is build the views. We figure out the context, we start the process of loading the data, and that doesn't always happen right away. So the first step is building the views. We go through the layout, we go through all the visible objects, and this is an important caveat. We're not gonna build a view for every single layout object that you have defined on your layout. Things that you can't see, like they're scrolled off to the side of the layout, they're, they're past the layout's edge, for instance, those objects only partially get built up. So they're kind of there in suspended animation waiting for you to scroll them into view. 
uh, objects that are totally not visible, objects that are in background tab panels or objects that are in an unpopped popover, we don't do any setup for those objects. There's no view yet. There will not be a view until you click on it and make it visible. So once the views are set up, any of them that could be visible, we go through each of them and we ask it to evaluate its visibility calc. That's the one in the, the kind of hide object when. And that gives each object a chance before we start loading data to figure out if it's actually gonna be there or not. Once we've done that pass, we send yet another message to all the views that are still left and tell them to lay themselves out and get ready for rendering. And this internal layout step is the thing that makes your drop-down list look like a drop-down list or your calendar control look like a calendar control. This step moves all the internal pieces and parts of the layout object into place. Uh, so if you are looking at something like a, a tab control, if you were to catch it before it did its layout, it wouldn't have tabs. It wouldn't have anything. Everything would always be jammed up towards the top left corner. So this is something we handle for you, but in order to minimize the amount of work that's done, we wait until the very last minute to start this process. So now we've got our views in place. Uh, they're ready to load data. They're ready to become interactive. And to start that process, the first thing we need to do is figure out the context. Where is this data coming from? In form view, it's a pretty simple story. If it's on your layout, it's coming from that base tables context. Doesn't matter really which part it's in. The only thing that throws a wrench into the works in form view is a portal. A portal brings another context under your layout. A portal has a related set, and each row has got a different, each row of the portal, the context is slightly different. It, it points to a different row in that related set. When you're in list view, things get a little bit more complicated. Uh, the, the context depends on the part. So the first row is gonna load from the first record. The second row is gonna load from the second record. Easy stuff. Some of our other parts have different behavior. Things like headers and navigation, they always have their context set to the current record, not the first or last. Um, so once we've got all of that sorted out, and I forgot to mention popovers, they're kind of interesting. Popovers don't really care where they are on the screen in terms of their context. Their context depends only on one thing, and that one thing is where is the button that causes this popover to pop up? Wherever you position that button, every single object inside of that popover is gonna behave as if it lived inside of that part. So if the popover button is in a portal row, all the objects in that popover are gonna behave as if they're also in that portal row, even though they're drawing off in separate space. So, got our views up, get a request from the OS. Now it says, hey, I wanna draw this part of the screen. The next step for us is to get the data. Before FileMaker 14, we actually intermingled the rendering and the data fetching. So the OS would say, hey, FileMaker, we wanna draw this corner of your screen. We would visit all the views that are inside of that rectangle and start drawing them from back to front. As we hit a view that has data in it, we'd stop, we'd ask, the, ask Draco, do you have the information for us? If it didn't, we'd sit there and wait a little bit. And uh, that didn't work well. Uh, modern operating systems do not like it when you sit there and wait for seconds upon seconds and they're in the middle of some tight drawing loop. Uh, modern operating systems, when they're rendering, they're locking up the graphics processor, and that's a, a resource that only one process at any given time can have access to. So to be a better player in modern OSs and really to improve our own performance and take advantage of, of uh, some caching, we now uh, visit each view before we draw. So when we tell the OS, hey, we've got an area of the screen that needs update, right at that point in time is when we're going to fetch all of your record data, not later on when the OS comes back and tells us, okay, we're ready to draw. So what happens, we go through every single view that's visible and inside of the rectangle that the OS wants to draw. So if the window's covered up by something, we're not gonna bother with those objects that are covered up. If the window is resized and you can only see a quarter of the layout, we're only gonna visit those quarter of the objects. 
And every object gets a chance to load its data. Uh, if there's a container, it'll start pulling that down. We'll try to evaluate any calcs that are required, like conditional formatting. And once it's done, remember, we're not drawing yet. This is, we're ready to draw. So the change that we made in FileMaker 14 was after this happens, inside of the view, in memory, we cache what we're about to render locally. Uh, this is something new. This is one of the reasons that we always reiterate to people that you shouldn't make any assumptions about when and how often we do things like evaluating uh, unstored calcs. Because with this cache, I could decide that I only want to evaluate these unstored calcs every couple minutes or every layout load. We tried to keep it as same as we could to the, the past behavior, but in order to get things faster and faster, as we introduce more and more caching, you'll notice those unstored calcs getting evaluated less and less. And on some platforms, and on more in the future, you'll see that starting to happen uh, as we begin to increase the amount of caching that we do. I'll show you a demo of that in a little bit. So just because you've asked for data doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna get it. There's a concept in FileMaker that was uh, introduced a few releases ago called deferred. And what happens, we, I think we introduced to this with containers first, is you can visit each object in the list, but maybe you don't actually get back data right away. Maybe we're still prefetching those rows, or maybe this container is uh, 5.8 terabyte image of the space shuttle launch that you got on your, your giant camera that has to be towed. Whatever it is, there are some circumstances that we will just wait. And what happens is the OS is telling us, or we're telling the OS, hey, we wanna draw. We're fetching the data. And then maybe a few milliseconds after that, the OS comes back to us and says, okay, go ahead and draw it. If we hit one of these objects that's been deferred, what we do is we just draw a blank. And that's a new behavior. It makes FileMaker layouts appear a little bit more web-like in a way, because you might have a layout that comes up and initially a lot of the fields are empty. The picture might not show up. You'll get the little uh, data loading symbol. When that deferred load happens, we treat it as if um, there's an update that's gonna come from the server. And that's what'll, when it finally does download, we get a notification that says, hey, this is ready. And then we go through those views. We don't have to rebuild them. They're there, they're waiting. And just tell them to redraw. They'll fetch the new data, and then the images or text will pop in one by one. So there's some situations where this deferred loading does not happen. Um, we don't use it for unstored calcs. We don't use it for related data that is outside of a portal. Inside of a portal, we do the deferred load, and you might see that new feature where the, the inline portal progress bar for a portal sort, that's an example of deferred loading. We don't do deferred on summary computations, and we don't use it for ESS, or external data sources. Uh, this deferred loading only happens in browse mode, so you won't see it while you're printing. Probably be a bad experience if we just go and we'll just go update that paper later on, don't worry about it. Just run it through the printer one more time. Um, it does not happen while a script is running. Once again, because we're assuming that your script, if you're asking for what's the data in this field, you don't wanna get blank, ask us again later. Uh, and then when a script is not running but presenting modal UI, we also turn off deferral. And that's just a usability experience thing. We don't want the script to be asking you for some interaction, but then you see a completely blank layout behind it. That, that seems broken to us. So we reserve the right to change any of this. You'll notice I said not on related data outside of portals for now. We're planning on expanding this to include related data that's just in a field on the layout. Um, we're looking at ways to expand it to include things like uh, sorts that are triggered off of fields. Uh, we're looking at seeing how we could apply this to summary data. Basically anything that blocks your interaction, anything that would cause the layout to pause or cause uh, a loading screen to come up, 
that's a point that we want to look at maybe move, doing more of this deferred loading. So keep your eyes peeled in the future. This is going to be a thing that we continue to evolve. So we've got the data. We've got the views. Everything's ready to go. Now we move on to rendering, putting these pixels to the screen. Um, before we had to worry about performance, like the first few months we started writing this feature for the new design surface, the story for drawing was really easy. And I could, I could give you guys the whole picture in just a couple minutes. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to lie to you first and tell you it's all easy. And then we're going to dive down into how it actually works and the, the optimizations we've had to make to, to get things to be fast. So the simple story. Operating system tells us, I want to see this part of your window. Not the whole thing, just a piece of it. We go through every single view that intersects that rectangle from the back to the front. And we tell that view, hey, draw yourself. And essentially, we're drawing all of them into one big image. So every one gets drawn right on top of the other. And that's it. That's how most rendering worked up until about 10 years ago. Uh, then we started worrying about retina displays and graphics processors. And oh, oh, yeah, you've got this iPhone that we expect the same performance on, even though it's got half of the CPU power. So the real story for rendering really does depend on a lot of things. Um, it can depend on the platform. On iOS, we do really aggressive caching. We do really aggressive hardware acceleration. On Mac, it's less granular. We're not doing as much of that. On Windows, we're really not doing any of it. We're still rendering using that old, simple story that I just told you, where we go from the front to the back, or the back to the front, drawing all into one image. On web, it's going to vary based on browser. Some of them are very smart in how they generate images and cache things. Some of them are, are less smart. Um, and it also can depend on the layout. If we encounter an object that's too large for the operating system to cache, we have to fall back into uh, compatibility rendering mode, which I'll, I'll show you in a little bit. But on iOS, what that means is tiling. I don't know if you've ever looked at a layout on FileMaker Go and you're scrolling and you see the pieces of layout come up in big squares. Like you'll just see like a chunk of it come in in a rectangle. That means that you've got something on that layout that's so big that we can't fit it onto a texture on the graphics card. So I kind of want to show a little demo of how this looks different on Mac and uh, iOS. So I'm going to turn on my mirroring. You guys can see what I'm seeing. We're going to open up Xcode, which is dangerous. And I'm going to try to do this without making you guys watch me do a full build. There we go. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to launch FileMaker as it is today. This is the shipping product. And this is going to show you not the FileMaker views, but the graphics layers that back them. And what you'll see here let me go back into Xcode. This is just a fairly simple layout. Not a whole lot going on here. And in Xcode, if I pause this, and hello, there it is. So you can see if I turn this around and we start looking at it from the side, there's really just one view here that's doing all of our drawing. It's just this one right here. This single view is what's getting all of our objects composited into it. And this is how Mac behaves. This is how Windows behaves right now. Uh, the only exception on Mac 
if I continue this and I pop open a uh, popover, we're going to do that same step. Is a popover. And you can see here that the popover got its own native view, the, the system view, the one that's backed by the hardware uh, or the GPU. So in this case, we've got basically two views with all your content. One contains the popover. Sorry, I need to. One contains the popover, and the other one contains all the rest of your objects. So let's take a look at another build. And this is more akin to what we have going on on iOS. And for those of you who are paying attention, you'll notice that this isn't iOS. This is a Mac build. Why are you telling you, us that your Mac build behaves like iOS? We might eventually want our Mac build to behave more like iOS, and we might be working on that. But <laughs> if we were, I, I couldn't tell you that. I just built this demo out of the kindness of my heart to, to show you all how it behaves. Um, but in all seriousness, the kinds of things that we did to speed things up on iOS are because iOS pushed more and more and more pixels, and they didn't give us faster processors. We just had to get smarter. So you can see on iOS, everything looks the same, or in the iOS rendering cell, everything looks the same until we go into Xcode and until we pull this up inside the view debugger. You have to pardon Xcode. It's a little slow when we're doing this. I, I miss my giant Mac Pro at work. So I slide this one sideways, and you're going to see a whole different story. So we essentially create OS-level accelerated views for every single object. And not just every single object. We create multiple views for a single object. So you can see here with these text fields, there's one layer that has the text in it. There's another layer behind it that's drawing the background of that view. And the row itself has another view. Basically, all the pieces and parts are drawn into their own space. And what that does for us is, in the old world, if I needed to redraw this row that says new task five, I would have to invalidate this region of the screen and I'd have to visit all the views that intersect that region of the screen to render. So that means I'd have to render the layout background. I'd have to lay, render the portal, the portal row, the field, and the text. In the iOS world, and maybe in the future Mac world, since all these things are cached independently and the text changes, I don't draw anything. All I do is I redraw the text and I tell the GPU recomposite all this stuff. All the rest of this is in memory, it's on a texture, and because of that, it is blazingly fast. Um, so that's a little look at how we render on, on iOS, and if you caught my hint, maybe how we'll render on Mac in the, in the future. And eventually, we plan on bringing this to Windows, too, because this is the secret for us to get really high performance, to get animations, to get uh, I don't know if you've seen the new Macs that have the, the 3X retina displays. I mean, 4K, that's a lot of pixels. Uh, so let me go back into the slides. And let's talk about how this works. So I kind of showed you this a little bit. When we're doing this accelerated composition, we split views into two. We have the piece that's kind of static and shared, and we have the piece that's very unique and not shared. So every field looks the same. So we split the background of the field off into its own piece and the text into yet another one. And the, um, the background one we cache, we reuse, and if we see other objects that have the same styles, we don't even bother rendering that field when we get to it. We say, we already rendered this thing. We've got the cache. Just show that again. Um, so by splitting it into the background and the foreground, we can also take some, uh, some shortcuts with rendering the background. 
The thing we're really limited by on iOS and in the future on Mac with, with high resolution displays is the size of these textures. So how many pixels are in this image? For a field, the number of pixels is the width times the height times whatever your device's scale factor is. So on a retina device, it's two or three. I don't want to store all of that because if I take a look at things like the corner radius and the border thickness and exclude those, everything inside of those red lines is the same. I don't need to store all those pixels for the graphics card to use. So what we do instead is we slice these, these textures up and then grab only the pieces that are unique and we shrink them down into a minimal image representation. So now, every time you see a field on this layout on iOS, as long as the fields look the same, they have the same settings, same border width, same fill color, we can just reuse this little tiny texture to draw all your fields. We store that texture to the disk, or actually it probably goes into memory, although on a phone it's hard to tell, it's SSD. And then once we have uh, the view that needs to get drawn, we just send that texture to the GPU and let it stretch it out. The GPU is really, really good at this kind of thing. That's its only job. It draws textures stretched out into a coordinate space. So essentially, we're taking all the stuff that we would have done on the CPU, we're pushing it off onto the graphics card, leaving the CPU free to do things like run your database, sort things, uh, filter things. So we do this beyond just fields. Um, the slicing that we have to do for other object types isn't as uh, efficient. So a popover, for instance, we can't fully slice it. It just gets sliced in uh, two ways and we'll stretch it out vertically for this type of popover, or well, horizontally for this type of popover, or vertically for the other. Uh, for tab controls, you'll see a similar thing happen, those slice points are at the top and bottom. And the nine part is really anything that's rectangular we can be really efficient with. So that's text labels, uh, rectangles, buttons, portals. For the more complex controls, we slice things into three parts. And it's not just the object that makes a difference. The way you style the object also makes a difference. So a rectangle, we can slice up but a styled rectangle, we may or may not be able to. So you can see here, for this rectangle at the top left, it's got a solid color fill. There's nothing unique about the inside of that, so we can slice out all but one pixel of that background border. For a horizontal gradient, it's got a different value at every point across the x-axis. For a vertical gradient, same story for the y-axis. So when we go to shrink these down and make a minimal texture, the solid color version is real easy and we get a lot of compression there. But for the gradients, we can only really shrink them down to a single row or a single column of pixels. And for something like a dashed line, there's nothing we can do. There's no way we can slice that up and preserve all the details. Um, so it's something to keep in mind when you're working on iOS layouts. And in the future, when you're working on layouts for Macs or Windows machines with massive screens and lots of pixels, is some things can't be accelerated. Um, images, no amount of slicing we can do on images will make them look good. They'll just look like we cut up an image and stretched out some bits. Um, especially watch out for really large images. If your object is larger than the texture size for your device, we can't do accelerated rendering. We'll fall back into that tiled rendering mode. And you'll know when it happens because you'll be scrolling through your list view and you'll see this checkerboard appearance of all of your objects as they come in. Um, I think the maximum size on old iOS devices is 1024 by 1024. On most modern iOS devices, it's 4096 by 4096. It really just depends on the GPU. So once we hit that limit, we gotta start going to tiling. Um, gradients, you saw that we can accelerate perfectly horizontal and perfectly vertical gradients. You change it a degree off, nothing we can do. It's gotta be full image cached because there's, 
Basically, we'll lose information if we slice it anyway. Uh, and then dashed and dotted lines are the other piece. So um, I guess the other thing that I mentioned that I didn't mention is that Zoom comes into account here too. So you may have noticed in FileMaker Go a while ago, we reduced the maximum zoom from 400 to 200. This is why. If you zoom something to 400x or to 400, and it's a 100 by 100 object, well, all of a sudden, we're drawing it at 400 by 400, and it's a retina display, multiply that by three, all of a sudden, I've got a 1200 by 1200 image I've got to cache. So the more you're zoomed in, the more you're gonna tax the GPU, the bigger your textures are gonna get. So that is what I got for the foundational stuff. Now I wanna dig in and talk a little bit about FileMaker 16, some of the changes we've made, and how it ties into what we've learned up until this point. Um, the big things that have to do with the layout in FileMaker 16 are the layout objects window. That's a pretty easy one to draw the connection. Uh, animations and transitions, card style windows, and uh, rendering on server, which is what we're, what we're doing for the PDF feature. So I wanna talk about the layout object window first. This window shows you your layout objects, what I was just talking about. You see the tree, you see the model. You don't see the views. So you're only gonna see each object once, even if it's showing up in multiple rows, multiple portal rows, multiple list view parts. Um, the layout object window is a great tool. It lets you search and filter, select objects, hide objects, rename objects, adjust the Z order. Uh, I think one of the best ways for me to, to show you though is just to, let's go play with it. So I think this is a feature that has at least for me, change the way that I work in FileMaker. So let me pop open, I'm sorry. This file, and you can see here that the layout object window is really just that tree that I was talking about. If you have a popover, you see that the popover button contains the popover. The popover contains all the things inside of it. Um, you've got the same relationship happening here with groups. It's a parent-child relationship. Um, I really love the layout object window because it lets me quickly rename these groups. Uh, you can see here this color options header. This used to just be called group, but now I can, I can give it a name. I've been using this to organize my layouts. I start making groups not because I need a group, but because I want this layout objects window to be a little bit cleaner, a little bit easier to use. Um, you can see through the layout object windows that some of the things that FileMaker does is a little bit interesting. Um, this is something I don't recommend you do too often, but let's say we have a text object. And I'm gonna give it just some random name. And I'm gonna make it look like a button. I'm gonna copy the style from this one and paste it over here. And then I'm gonna to go to button setup. And this is, I mean, this is how FileMaker has treated buttons since the beginning of time until FileMaker 12. FileMaker 12 introduced a new way of doing buttons, an actual button layout object. But when you do these old style buttons, I don't know if you saw what just happened there. Let me undo so we can get another chat at it. You see up there where it says, old, sad button. When I apply button setup to this, it puts it in a group. So that's all button setup really does, is it takes your selection, it puts it in a group, and it applies a scripting action to it. Well, you can apply a scripting action to it. We'll uh, beep. The downside with this is because of the way that the layout object tree works. In the old world, before FileMaker 16, when you clicked on a group, we selected that group and we selected all the things inside that group at the same time. So you could go over to the inspector and change the color, change the style of this button just by clicking on it once. We had to break that for this layout object tree feature because now it's possible to just select the group and not select the button inside of it. And in most cases, that's what you want. You don't want to edit all the things inside your group just because you've got one item in it selected. 
So because of that change we've made, if you are working on a layout with lots of these old style buttons, you're, well, you, you could go through the old way of doing it, which is ungroup the object, make your changes, regroup it, but we don't do that anymore. We use the layout objects window, and you just have to click inside, and once you select the text object that's inside of that group button, then you can start to modify it. So I just wanted to point that out. I, I think that's probably the only downside of this new feature, but we're working to make it better, as Rob showed you in the keynote. We're giving you that ability to click, to directly select. Uh, I haven't been using FileMaker 16 because I love that feature so much. I'm, I'm already on FileMaker next to, to get the subgroup selection. <laughs> I feel bad you guys have to wait for it. Um, not that bad, though. Um, let me see, anything else about the layout object tree? The question was, should I go through and convert my old style buttons to the new style ones? And I think for your, your sanity, I would do it when you can, especially when they're like this. When your old style buttons are really just a group with one other object inside of it, it's more complicated than it needs to be. It's actually a heavier layout than it needs to be. Each of these objects, it's not a lot of space, but each layout object does take up a few K of memory. Uh, and when we build up the, the view hierarchy, that view takes up a little bit of memory. And we start caching things, that extra level of cache takes up a bit of memory. So if you've got one of these on your layout, it's not gonna make a big difference. If you've got a thousand of them, it would make a huge difference if you switch them all over to the, the new style buttons, these ones that you can kind of draw out from the inspector. The other great thing about these buttons is they have built-in icons. All the icons we ship with are SVGs. Uh, if you're not familiar with them, that's a, a vector graphics support. So no matter how big you want to draw this, since it's all vector, the file size is just a few bytes, really. Whereas anything that's raster, like a TIFF or a PNG, the bigger you want to draw it, the higher resolution file you've got to give us. So these button glyphs and these features, I think, make our new buttons powerful enough that they're worth it and they're gonna be faster too. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind or to, to know about the layout object tree, if you haven't discovered it yet, you have the ability to filter based on object type. The thing that I love is if you right click on one of these, you can hide objects that are either in front of or behind the object that you're working on so you can get a real clear view of it. Um, and something interesting, we try to persist this state as long as we can. So if you switch into browse mode and back, we're gonna remember that things are hidden. If you switch to another layout and back, we're gonna to try to remember which things are hidden. If you go to a layout and you know there are objects on it, but you don't see any of them, check the layout objects window. You probably had them hidden from the last time you were working here. I've gotten bit by that once. I was like, oh my God, I lost my whole layout. Oh no, 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 I just, I hit everything. It's, <laughs> it's okay, I just went into browse mode and proved to myself that I'm not losing it. So I guess that's an important thing to keep in mind. This hit hiding and showing here has no impact on browse mode whatsoever. It's just a feature for you guys in layout mode. Um, okay, so back to the presentation. Back to the slides. One quick yes. This button right here. Yeah. Yes, this makes new buttons. The only way to make old style buttons is to right click on an object on the layout and say button setup. And the way that you can tell really easily is when you're in button setup, you get this little descriptive text here that says this is considered to be a group button, only its action can be modified. So if you see that, that means it's an old school button. If you don't see that, it means you're using one of our new actual button objects. The other way to find out is just look at the layout object tree. If you see that you got a group where you expect a button, that's what's going on. Uh, yes? What's that? How do you view everything that's hidden? Uh, this button right here, the eyeball, will, um, will show everything, even the stuff that's hidden. So let's, let's take this, we're gonna hide all other objects. So now we only see that. If you see this eye is lit up, it means things are hidden. If you click it, 
We're going to show all the hidden things. Is that a toggle? It's not a toggle. It's just a show all. It's a show all button. Um, a toggle would be kind of cool, though. I'm going to write that down at some point. Let me take a note. Um, actually, let me get through the presentation, and then, then I'll take a note. Um, animations and transitions, we added these for FileMaker Go right now. We've got great plans of them coming to the rest of the platform, but they're so important for the, the look and feel on Go that we just had to get them out there for you guys on, on iOS first. Um, I'm not going to dig into these too much. They're pretty simple. On any Go to layout or Go to related record, you can attach an animation. The one thing I did want to mention is the way this works is the animation starts as we're building up that new layout. So the process is we start the animation. First step, we take a snapshot of the current layout. And then we put a view with that snapshot on top of the current layout. And that way, we can tear down the views that are for the old layout. And we start building up the views for your new layout. So if you see any performance problems with animation, I wouldn't pay too much attention to the layout that you're on. That snapshot is wicked fast, because it's all done in hardware on iOS. Pay more attention to the layout that you're going to. That's the thing that's going to be slow. That's the piece that's going to be variable speed. So if you see your animation a little bit slower than you'd want, or the, the layout that's animating in is taking a while to show up, focus on the layout you're going to. The problem's probably not on the layout you're coming from. Um, card window is another great feature that we added. It's basically just another window with no frame. So it looks like it's part of your window. Um, we give you full control over where it shows up, what size it is, and one really important thing, the initial layout. Um, I was going to switch back into the app to show you this, but if you go to the uh, new window script step, you'll notice that option there where you can say which layout you want for this new window. That can save you a whole bunch of work. Well, not you, your app, FileMaker. Because when we open up that new window, it's going to be on the current layout with the current found set. If that's not the layout you want, we're loading the layout objects. We might start loading the views. We might get a chance to start loading the data. So I would definitely take a look at your current solutions where you're using new window and start taking advantage of that new option that allows you to say, which layout do I want this to start on? The other thing that we changed in the new um, in the new window script step dialog is if you don't type in a value for the width or height, we'll infer it from the layout that you've chosen. So that way, you've got one less place to change if you want to modify the size of that custom dialog. And for the position, if you don't give us values there, we'll try to center it. I was going to do a demo, but we're going to skip that. So next, uh, printing on PDF, or printing in PDF on server and web direct. This is a feature we spent a lot of time on. Uh, the way we designed our, our view system, the thing that does all the rendering on Mac, Windows, iOS, it's built to print. And it doesn't care where it happens. It, it doesn't care if it's printing to a display or, or to a PDF. So when we went to move this feature down to the server, all we really had to do is take our view system, take the, the views, and bring them down into the server. So when you start a print or PDF job on, on server, it's the same process as you see when you're on the desktop looking at your views. We're visiting the same layout objects. We are creating the same views. We're using all the same rules for loading data and pre-processing them. And because of that, we get really great fidelity when we go to print or PDF on, uh, on server. We support sliding and shrinking because it's running the same code. We support all the page setup options because it's running the same code. The two things that you have to be really careful of using this feature are web viewers. It's hard to get a server to render web content and then print it. I don't know if it's impossible yet, but we wanted to get this first revision out here, and we were told that you know, that's not a deal breaker. Give it to us. We'll work around that. The other one that you can't really work around if you want to look professional is fonts. So you just got to keep in mind that when you're printing for FileMaker Pro or Go, it's all about which fonts your clients have installed. So if you want your report to look great, 
you need to make sure that on all the machines your clients are using, you have that special font installed. When you're talking about printing from WebDirect or from PerformScript on server, the client machines have nothing to do with it. It's all about the server. So you've got to make sure that that font is installed on that server, which on Mac, you're in pretty good shape. The servers come pre-installed with a bunch of fonts. Uh, Windows, I don't know what the story is there. I know there's not a huge collection. You probably don't have Word installed on your server, I hope. Um, so you might have to go buy the font, pay the money, buy the right license. Don't tell them Andrew told you to steal the font. I did not. Uh, and install that on your server. Linux, a little bit more challenging. So if you're using cloud and you want to use this feature, you're going to have to start researching what sort of fonts are available for Linux and make sure it's up there. We will fall back. If we don't find the font that you're looking for, we have fallback tables and we'll look for one that's as close as we can get. But oftentimes, I mean, I, I work with a lot of designers, close is not good enough. If they want Adobe Garamond and you give them times, have an unhappy designer on your hands. So that's one thing to keep in mind for uh, printing in PDF. I have some, uh, we, we're running low on time. I want to leave more time for questions. So I'm going to go through these really quickly. These are just some tips based on what we learned today that you can take home and apply. Hopefully you've heard a lot of these. Freeze window. Use it, use it, use it. Especially if you're switching layouts, especially if you're switching records while you're running a long running script. What freeze windows essentially does is it tells all of the views, stay where you're at, stop updating, don't do anything. So you can switch from layout to layout to layout, and we are reloading the layout objects. The model's got to be back there, otherwise your script wouldn't run. But the views, the pieces that are doing all the work, that manage all the data loading, they're staying there, and you've got the old versions. Because of that, though, at the end of a freeze window, you do pay a cost. At the end of a freeze window, we've got to rebuild up all the views, even if we're on the same layout, because we don't know if they're stale, if they're good, or they're bad. So freeze window, great to use for long running processes. If you run freeze window in a tight loop, that's probably not the best practice, because every time you unfreeze, it's going to rebuild your views. So it's best to have the freeze window outside of any tight loop. The unfreeze, I should be more, yeah, the unfreeze is really when the script, uh, when script runtime returns to the idle state. So if you've got a long running script, you don't have to worry about it. I think the bigger issue would be if you're running multiple scripts, one script right after another, each time is going to cause a, a separate freeze. As soon as we drop out of that script stack, uh, it will it'll allow the window to start going again. Um, redraw minimally. So when you're trying to update a part of your screen, if you can, just update that one part of your screen. The refresh object script step, it causes one view to redraw. Re grab your data and redraw. Refresh window is much, much, much heavier. It tells the whole layout to tear itself down, throw away all the views, build up all the views again, and then render. And this isn't a render later or render when you have the chance. This is a stop the scripting process, stop everything, render everything, and then continue once you're done. Refresh window is really heavyweight, and I avoid using it unless you have to. Um, we covered a lot of this already, but if you're really concerned about performance, especially on mobile and in the future on high resolution uh, desktop displays, solid fills are always going to be real fast. Uh, zero degree, 90 degree, 180 degree, 270 degree gradients can be optimized pretty well. Um, if you're using an image fill and you used our slicing options, uh, those are also going to be pretty fast. And like I said, the, the big killer is just images that are way larger than they need to be. If you put a 20 megapixel image on your layout, not much we can do about it. If you need to have that full re resolution image, put it in a container field. Our container fields are much smarter. They generate thumbnails on the server and will only deliver what you need to the client. But the images that you put in as the, the fill using the style inspector, those don't go through that same process. If you pick a 20 megapixel image and set it as a background fill, you're going to draw that image every time. Um, you can use visibility to take care of high cost objects. 
So if you've got an image that takes a long time to download, if you've got a chart that takes forever to render, if you've got a portal that takes an eternity to sort, one easy way might be to just say, does my customer need to see this the very second they load this layout? Or can I put it in a popover? Can I put it in another tab panel? You can even script that tab panel so that it doesn't switch and show until after the rest of the layout is at a chance to load and you get a little bit more interactivity. Um, finally, if, uh, if none of those other things work out and you're trying to figure out why is this layout slow, um, where I start is divide and conquer. I copy the layout, delete half of the stuff. Is it still slow? If it is, I know which half of the layout my problem is on. Uh, that's a fairly, it's kind of a brute force thing, but to be honest, we use it routinely in FileMaker. We use it routinely in our source code. <laughs> Sometimes if I can't figure out what piece of this code is broken, eh, I'll just delete that. Um, so if you use calcs to time your drawing, like if you're, if you're guessing that if you take a timestamp from when this calc is evaluated to when this other calc is evaluated and you, you measure in between, you figure out how long drawing takes, well, you can't do that anymore because we prefetch all the data before we even start to draw. So that's no longer a very reliable tool to use for performance measurement. Um, and then the other thing that can really slow things down is just check to make sure you're not going to a sorted set. Check to make sure you're not doing any expensive portal filtering. Uh, those are a lot of the places that I run into a lot where I see slowdowns. And we're not going to talk about that. I beat that to death. And I beat that to death. So that's it. We've got a few minutes for questions. What do you guys got for me? Yes, right there. So the question is that the server does the thumbnailing, and we're wondering if FileMaker Go does that on its own. Um, I'm not sure. I'll have to get back with you on that. I don't know if we'll do that in the local case. If Go is connected to a server, it 100% will. I'm just not sure if we've turned that on for that case. If you want to come up afterwards, I'll get your contact information and you touch base. Yes? Uh, the question is whether the caching that you guys do affects the caching that we do. The caching that we do is much more short term, and the format that we cache is closer to what we need to render. So if it's an image, we've done the processing to move it into the format that actually no, needs to go to the GPU. So they're really kind of independent. You're not going to be able to take advantage of our cache. And we have a separate layer of caching that's used by your scripts and, and, uh, and calculations and whatnot. That's all still in place. This is just another level of it on top that we have at the views. So what's the caching doing for, for uh, FileMaker files is if you've downloaded a set of records, it's keeping those records on the local file inside the temp file. So the next time you need them, the next time you need to sort, even if it's not the same sort, it's going to be a lot faster than pulling down that whole record list from the server. Um, a lot of times, our views are caching information that's right there on the local machine. It's just we're keeping it a bit closer to the GPU in a format that we need to, to render. Yeah, mainly the caches that you're dealing with inside the temp file, uh, that's going to have the bigger impact on reporting, on sorting, on filtering. These caches up in the view system don't affect those type of operations at all. Yes? That's a, the question, is there a way to specify the, the initial mode when you're doing the new, the new window step? And that's not something we've got on the roadmap right now, but it does seem like a good idea. I'm going to write that down. I've also gotten a uh, request to have the record set specified so you can say, don't show any records. And I think that's another interesting idea. I have to think about that, if there's a way to do that. Um, yeah, I think that controlling the record set would be a big help there. Uh, yes, over there. So the question is, is there a boundary that you hit with having too many objects on one layout? And the answer is, Eventually, yes. Um, when we first load the layout, before we even draw it, we have to download all that model information. So the more panels, the more tabs you add, eventually layout loads will get slower and slower. So that will be the, that'll be the symptom you'll see if you've got too many objects on your layout. The case that you're talking about where each individual new object 
is on a separate slide panel, actually that's not going to run into problems as fast as if they were all visible because as I mentioned, we don't create the objects and, or load the data for things that are on background slide panels until you make that panel or tab active. So you're still paying a cost because we've got to load up the model. We load up every layout object. But when it comes time to build the views, we're only going to build the views for the pieces that are actually visible at that moment. Uh, yes, yeah, and we, there was a session last year or the year before. If you look back on the community page, um, there is a, a session on button bars where Andrew Fan goes over RSVG format support. And we do support them for buttons. And we're looking at bringing them to a larger part of the product, yeah. I think I'm out of time. Uh, if anyone's got any other questions, I'm going to be around all conference. Uh, just grab me. Name's Andrew. Come find me. But uh, thank you all so much. I had a great time. Thank you. New slides up. And uh, please remember to fill out your, uh, your evaluation so they let me come back. Actually, they make me come back anyway. But fill out your session evaluations despite that. <laughs>